Our next speaker is Stu Solon. He's going to be talking about Rare's modified solid aluminum that supports for five function dialysis. Here. I'm very happy to be able to be here and participate in this forum. Um, I think one of the one of the pleasures of working at Exxon has been the opportunity to having John down the hall from us and uh, just being able to go and talk to him and him come and talk to us on a multitude of occasions. He's been both a um, role model for many of us as well as a really good friend. And I think we all feel like we're a lot better in many ways that we've known. Thanks a lot, John. And in fact, the, the subject I'm going to talk about today is, is very much related to an area that John uh, was a pioneer in, and that is uh, bifunctional uh, catalysis. And in fact, um, even an application in these days of um, sort of waning interest in reforming that was directed towards reforming. Uh, let me just acknowledge my co-authors here, particularly Gary, who's in the audience. And, uh, a lot of this work, this, this work kind of originated from the discussions that Gary and I had over a very simple concept. And what I show here is a, a sort of a qualitative artist rendition of a solid acidity scale, starting from weak acidity going to stronger acidity. The top line over here, representative of oxide materials the direction we would all like to go in these days. As you go down here, this next line will include halides, liquid acids, things that have some environmental uh, problems of varying degrees associated with them, but in many cases function extremely well. And over the last number of years, there's been a, a large effort to try to bridge or, or access some of the gaps that I've shown here with dotted lines on the top end of the scale, particularly in this area over here, strong acids, where we've all had the opportunity to hear hundreds of talks on sulfate and zirconia with people arguing about every sort of nuance, trying desperately to be able to access and do catalysis in this uh, area of strong acidity with oxide-based materials. And most of that type of catalysis does involve reactions involving paraffins, a lot of hydrogen transfer reactions, a lot of bimolecular catalysis with hydrogen transfer involved. But we've also seen, and what I'm going to talk more about today, is the fact that there's an opportunity in this sort of intermediate range of solid acidity. And that is in the area between the acid strength that you find in transitional aluminas and that that you find with the morphous silica aluminas, there is rather a large gap in the oxide scale, and consequently, People have used and continue to use, and certainly it was the, an integral part of the invention and, and the commercialization that John was involved in, just mild halide treatments of the transitional luminous to try to adjust the acidity, increase the acid strength, and change the nature of the acidity by adding low levels of chlorine and fluorine. Now, generally speaking, a lot of the, these reactions, or a lot of these, these acids are particularly well suited we're working in combinations with metals and providing a bifunctional mechanism that we've heard the last uh, two days with applications in several of these areas, hydroisomerization, reforming, and uh, the last one being just the acid themselves, molefin isomerization. So part of what our, our interest was was seeing if we could access materials over here, particularly to do reforming, in the absence of the halide on the support, part of that motivation has come from not, a, it's, it's not a horrendous environmental impact, but there are issues, particularly with chlorine being stripped off of alumina-containing catalysts during reforming. 
and the need, the necessity of continuously feeding low levels of organic chlorides to the process. Um, and then those materials are quite toxic and, and have come under uh, some issues in terms of being able to be used. So what, what Gary and I discussed and what we sort of decided might be a, in retrospect, somewhat very simple idea, but those oftentimes are the only ones we come up with, <laughs> is to start instead of with the aluminates <laughs> and increase the acidity, start with the silica aluminates and try to work our way back uh, and, and decrease the, the number and the strength of the acid sites to be in this area. Now, in trying to, to decide what to use for that, one would choose a titrant, which is essentially what we'll be doing, which will be mildly basic. And in that degree, we would like something that will be less basic than alkalis or alkaline earths, so that we can make relatively small changes in the, in the acid properties of the support. We would like that oxide titrant that we're going to Put on to be capable of forming a monolayer on the silk alumina. So again, so that we can control the amount and, and it will spread out, it won't fall up. It needs to be non-reducible because we're going to have the metal component present. And consequently, if we had a reducible uh, material there, we would form alloys and we would have problems with our metal. And finally, one of the issues with working with silk alumina is the difficulty of dispersing and maintaining a good dispersion of the platinum group metal. So one of the things we would have liked to have seen in sort of a serendipitous way is whether is, is to obtain better dispersion of the platinum on the modified support than on the silver balloon itself. All that being said, what seemed like a very logical thing to try was the very slightly basic uh, rare earth oxides as a way of modifying silica aluminum. And in fact, that's what I'm going to tell you about today. The effort. synthesis of the, of the platinized rare earth modified silica aluminates is very straightforward. We start off with silica aluminates of varying silica aluminate ratios. Typically, uh, ones we've worked with have been in, in, uh, in this range, 75% silica, 25% alumina. Onto them get impregnated rare earth nitrates. Uh, that can be easily done by incipient wetness, wetness, calcine to go to the rare earth oxide, and then platinum is put on and we found with the rare earth materials that we get the best dispersions with the uh, anionic precursor chloroplatinic acid and then just calcine these materials and reduce them. So they're very similar to the standard reforming catalyst. And the first thing you see in a very gross sense is that the rare earth oxides will tend to disperse very easily onto silica aluminum, at least on a, on a macroscopic level. What I mean by that, if you just look at the powder x-ray diffraction of an amorphous silica alumina and compare that, compare that to one that's very fairly uh, heavily loaded with rare earth oxide, you'll see very, essentially, no change. Uh, and that we, we see uh, no appearance of any crystalline rare earth oxide phases, even at very high loadings. Now, I am going to switch a little bit between some of the different rare earths since we did, we did and, and, and in fact, in a few slides later, I'll show you that there's not a large difference between most of them. We just like the different colors that we found, so we would switch from one to the other. So some of the data is obtained um, on, on neodymium. You're actually going to see some data that I'll show you on yttria. Yttria, in fact, is not technically a rare earth oxide, but in fact exhibits and behaves very much like one. So you'll see that in some of the slides. Okay, so there was our x-ray data. We also did some uh, ESCA measurements. Again, looking at the dispersibility of the rare earth oxide on silica alumina. And here we have a plot of the neodymium over silica alumina signal as a function of the loading of neodymium on the silica alumina. And we obtain essentially a linear plot in this range all the way up to about 30%. Uh, in 
indicating, in fact, that even to the, the ESCA surface probe, that we are, in, in fact, obtaining a, something close to a monolayer dispersion of the rare earth oxide on the silver moon. And it probably doesn't come as a major surprise, since the rare earth oxides are basic, support is acidic, and they tend to weigh each other extremely well uh, that, that this happens. Now, the other property that changes with the addition of the rare earth oxides, the physical properties that change, uh, is the surface area and the pore uh, size and pore volume. And what happens here, and this now I've switched over and I have data that I'm showing you on a, on a yttrium modified solar alumina. And one of the things that we see is if we start with the solar alumina with surface areas of around 300 meters squared per gram, by the time we get up to uh, approximately 15 percent weight percent loading of yttrium oxide, we'll be down to slightly less than 200 meters squared per gram. The pore volume will shrink from 0.78 to 0.52, and the pore size will move very slightly to to slightly higher pore radii. And all that seems to be indicating is the fact that as, the, as we start loading up the, the solar aluminum with the rare earth oxides, we tend to plug off some of the very small pores that will decrease our surface area and we'll leave what's left, uh, some of the larger pores left, and we'll move the, the pore size to larger size which decrease our total pore volume. It still leaves us plenty of surface area to work with, now, in doing some, some, some of the acidity characterization, what we used was a simple reaction test that Gary has pioneered over the years and used to, uh, on, on many, many different systems. And it's a very simple test using a substituted olefin, methyl substituted olefin, and looking at the ability of that olefin to do different types of isomerization, namely the movement of the double bond down the chain which is a very facile reaction that will occur with very weak acids or even bases, in fact. We, we can have the movement of the methyl group down the chain that requires a slightly stronger acid forming the 3-methylpentene 2 and the 2-methylpentene 2. And in some cases, as the acidity increases even further, you can generate a second branch that requires a higher uh, acid strength. And what we've done is look at the ratio of these different isomers as a measure of the change in acid strength. As the ratio will increase, as you, for example, increase the amount of the 2,3-dimethylbutane-2 to the 4-methylpentene-2, uh, that will indicate that there's an increase in the acid strength. This test is very sensitive for acids in this intermediate strength. Gary has shown very clearly and reported in previous meetings substantial differences in the selectivity ratios between uh, 6 tenths, 9 tenths, 1.2 percent chlorine on alumina. It can very clearly distinguish those type of differences when more traditional titration procedures and, and other techniques are, are very insensitive to that. So, If we then look at the results of that reaction test for a series of the very changing the neodymium content on the silica alumina. You see, of course, as you add neodymium, you will start to decrease your uh, ratio. This being an indication of the acid strength parameter. It will come down, and by putting an appropriate amount of the rare earth on there, you can get yourself in the acid range of materials that will have varying levels of chlorine or low levels of fluorine. And you can match very closely the parameters within a few tenths of a percent equivalently of the amount of chlorine that you'll have on the catalyst. So this seemed like it was moving things in the correct direction. Let me just briefly show you that um, one can use various rare earths. In fact, here I've, I've shown equimolar additions of neodymium, yttrium, lanthanum, gadolinium, and, and where they fit in relative to uh, chloride and alumina catalysts. The only one that really stands out here is the cerium oxide one. And you have two issues with cerium oxide and why that's different than all the other rare earths. First of all, it doesn't disperse the same way that the other rare earths do. And secondly, because of the presence of cerium plus four, one has a much less basic oxide even to begin with than the other rare earths. So with the exception of Syria, 
most of the rare earths, within the experimental era, the preparations and the measurements and so on, lie very close to one another and are fairly interchangeable in, in doing this type of treatment. So the acidity seemed to be in the right area of what we wanted in terms of getting something close to about a percent chlorine, 1% uh, chloride of aluminum. Now, I mentioned earlier it would have been nice to have a serendipitous result in terms of the metal dispersion. Well, in fact, that's also what happened. We did find, in fact, that as you put more neodymium onto the silica alumina and measure the platinum dispersion, you in fact would find that as you loaded up your surface with the rare earth, you were able to access dispersions in about the 0.5 to 0.6 um, fractional dispersion range, 50 to 60 percent uh, dispersion based on strong hydrogen chemisorption measurements. And this is it's not quite as high as one can get on a platinum on halide alumina catalyst, where generally you can get 70 to 90 percent, or sometimes even higher. But it's it's substantially better than one, one better than what one will obtain on a neat silver alumina catalyst. So this seemed to be working okay at, uh, as well. In fact, I have a electron micrograph here. And these things never show up all that well. But on, on the left-hand side here, we have the uh, 3 tenths percent platinum on just the neat soil alumina, and you can see very large platinum particles on this part of the material. When you put the, in this case, it was 4% nitri on the silica alumina, we don't see any of the same types of large platinum particles. So that's consistent with the chemistry options. So everything was going along just fine until we tried to do reforming with it. And here we looked at the reaction of normal heptane. And it's basically uh, three particular pathways that we're interested in. One which I've represented here, uh, and Bert can discuss this later if he wants, the direct dehydrocyclization of the normal heptane to toluene, which we've attributed to predominantly a, a metal function. Then we have the isomerization of the heptane to isohexanes. And finally, we have cracking, and then that normally is, a, is considered to be a metal and acid uh, combination reaction. As well as we can get cracking, both to metal cracking and acid cracking, and get, get the C6 minus products that I've indicated here. Well, the first thing that you find when you, when you do this reaction, and you compare it against just a platinum on a chloride aluminum catalyst, is that at the same space velocities and temperature and pressure conditions, for example, you wind up with a catalyst which is much less active than the platinum chloride aluminum catalyst. The other thing that you see besides the hidden activity that you take is that the selectivities that you find are also substantially different. And, and they're different in the following sense. We're in fact making substantially less of the product we really want which is the aromatic uh, toluene formation, shown here for the chloride alumina. And the rare earth silica alumina has, in fact, improved versus the neat silica alumina. But we have not been able, it looks like, to go through the pathway of doing the direct metal dehydrocyclization with these catalysts as easily as we can with the traditional platinum chloride alumina catalyst. I might just add that the other products that we get, namely the crack products, are in fact slightly lower on the rare earth silica alumina than they are on the chloride alumina. So it's not that we're losing, um, we're not losing our feed to crack products with this. We do have some of that problem going on with the neat silica alumina, but we have cut back these light gas made with the rare earth silica alumina, but we're doing predominantly isomerization instead of the dehydrocyclization and, aromat and aromatic So it, it that in fact looks like the metal, in, in, in kind of the hypothesis that we have is that the metal is not functioning in the same way on these type of supports as it is on the halide aluminum. So we tried to look at that a little bit more, realizing that the dehydrocyclization is a very metal demanding reaction and we might have 
In fact, not only differences in acid strength, but in fact, some sort of metal differences depending on the type of support. Since, since uh, we did this work, we have in fact seen some literature references describing uh, or attributing decreased metal activity to supports that are basic, increased metal activity on supports that are more acidic. So I think other people are seeing things in very different types of reactions that may be parallel in this. I have a piece of data here which tends to support that type of argument. And that is we did a very simple reaction here, just hydrogenating benzene to cyclohexane. And a very simple uh, reaction, we just raise the temperatures and then look for the conversion to cyclohexane. We find that it occurs at a much lower temperature with the platinum on the halide aluminum than it does with platinum on either of these two where it modified silver aluminum. So the tentative conclusion that we had at this point, again, was that the metal was not acting strictly it didn't, was not acting sufficiently for the very metal demanding dehydrocyclization reaction. On the other hand, these type of catalysts, when they require metal activity, a much more moderate level of metal activity, namely that of just dehydrogenation and hydrogenation, which you might have in a simple isomerization reaction, will work quite well. And here we contrast some platinum on fluoride of alumina catalysts with those of varying levels of yttria on silica alumina. Here we're showing the conversion as a function of the residence time. You can see in this case the 9% yttria silica alumina is very similar to the fluoride alumina. 4% is, is going to be slightly more active. And if you look at the selectivities, here plotted is the selectivity to the isomerate C12 isomers as a function of conversion. In fact, you find that uh, the uh, platinum Rare earth as well as the silver aluminum behave quite well. Uh, in fact, even better selectivities to isomer than fluoride aluminum. So this type of reaction, which does not require very much metal or is not very metal demanding, will work extremely well with these catalysts. However, the reforming reaction is not. So just to summarize our conclusions at this point. The rare earth modified amorphous silver aluminum supports have adjustable acid strengths comparable to the halide of luminous. The rare earth introduction enhances the subsequent platinum dispersion on the bifunctional catalyst made with these supports. The metal activity appears to be weaker than on the halide of luminous, which produces different catalytic behavior, particularly with metal demanding reactions such as dehydrocyclization. With non-metal demanding reactions, bifunctional catalysis closely resembles that of the halide of luminous. And so, we still have plenty of opportunity to try to find improvements to John's 30 or 40 year old work. And one of the other things that John taught me was to be very persistent to the point of being a nudge. And uh, <laughs> consequently, we have worked with these, these types of uh, catalysts and have found some very interesting applications in other areas. But due to the fact that we're out of time, I'll not get into that at the moment. <laughs> so, I'd just like to thank you for your attention and try to take any questions. <laughs> Let's say what goes around comes around. Um, not many of you will be familiar with this, but I stumbled onto it by accident. Um, the development of the fluid cracking catalyst in uh, the Exxon introduced in 1942, one of the catalysts that was first used was a silica alumina ion exchange material which Nelco Chemical Company had been developing as a main way of making a synthetic water softener. And they had developed an indoor process for making silica alumina zeolite. They called it zeolite material. And um, Exxon discovered that if they washed the sodium out with ammonia, you had a very active cracking catalyst. And so in night, in, during World War II, that plant was under security. And uh, I was director of research there in 1957. I kept getting these requests. There was a big bin of this catalyst up in the, on the side bins. And I kept getting this request from people for this acidic silica loop. And uh, it took me some time to learn just what had gone on there. The other part would I, I wanted to, uh, again, sort of gravebeard you and remind you that Frank Ciappetta won the Precision Award 
uh, for introducing, first of all, a nickel silica alumina reforming catalyst, and then the platinum silica alumina reforming catalyst. And the way he did it uh, to control that silica alumina, to control the acidity, uh, which you were trying to do in a different way, was to steam treat the surface until you got down to this low acidity. And uh, the only trouble with it, even then, platinum did not disperse on silica right. alumina exactly. like it that did. Was the, exactly. I mean, our thought path went the same way as your latter comments. Yeah. The problem with doing that, of course, is to control that steaming well. And starting out with a high silica catalyst to begin with and steaming it, it's just going to become more silica rich and the problem with the metal dispersion. So we thought this might be a, this might be the way around it. Professor Hall. Can we look at your second slide? It was not too much trouble. Keith, you still trouble. And I only have 58. Actually, John presented a challenge for me last night. He said, I'd like to see if you can do this talk in 58 slides so you can break the old time record. <laughs> that was established yesterday. <laughs> this one? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> the point I'd like to make is that the chemistry of the Aluminum surface is very different from the chemistry of the silica aluminum surface. Right, the silica aluminum surface is clearly a Brunstead acid. Right. If you go over to alumina, it's at best amphoteric, but it tends to be basic. And when it acts as an acid at a little higher temperature, right. it works with dual acid base sites. In other words, pulling molecules mm -hmm. apart. Uh, in this way. So, isn't there a sort of a little problem here of apples and oranges, you know? There is no question, you know, your point is very well taken, Keith, of course. And I will say, though, I mean, at least from the data that I've seen in the literature, when people have put low levels of halide on aluminum, they do tend to increase the amount of bronze and acidity. So that, that is a way, but they're very different, of course, they're not going to be exactly the same. The point is, for a very sensitive reaction, like the two methyl pentene, they look very much the same. And when you don't have the strong metal dependence, when you're doing hydroisomerization, you can get them to look like each other very much. But clearly, there are situations where that difference is going to play out. And I think this is exactly what happened in this case. It depends on the reaction you choose. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, the, you know, the, what has happened when you introduce, uh, say, fluorine? on an aluminum surface. It substitutes for a hydroxyl group. So you cut down the number of OH groups you have. But the, the ones that remain tend to be much stronger acids, Brunstead acids, than they were otherwise. And um, uh, I just, uh, so, uh, so then, you, you, then you start over the silica aluminum, and you're trying to make it more like aluminum, but Seems but would like you say that the alumina in the silica alumina is in fact generating, you know, a Bronsted acid site also? And what we're doing here is essentially titrating out the ones on the strong end, because the ones that you form when you put fluorine on alumina are not as strong as when you have the alumina mixed in with the silica. So again, it, it, it wouldn't be the same, otherwise we wouldn't have a different material. But well, when you put, start putting rare earths on this thing, you are putting on, uh, again, Amphoteric type material, right. materials, which are, which are uh, sort of like alumina. Right. So uh, I don't know exactly what you're getting, uh, uh, but it just sort of worries me when you're trying to have uh, a uh, one type of acidity and another, another, clearly another type of acidity at higher. I yes, agree. Sure. I think I think, and that's why it works for some reactions and it doesn't for others for exactly that reason. Okay. okay. So, what, two questions. Number one: If you have residual nitrate produced epoxy nitrate on the surface of your catalyst, can that have a significant effect on the way that catalyst behaves? Because the way you prepare those using the nitrate, you've been studying nitrogen oxide and aluminum. You can have some very stable oxy nitrates that are very difficult. may not have the true oxide, but you may very well have an oxynitrate residual material left on the surface. And 
I, and certainly, I mean, that, that that would be an issue if we had it. I, in my feeling is between five and six hundred degrees C. Or it's understand under some certain. If we look at it with grits, and, and that's not sufficient sometimes to, to completely get rid of all the nitrate. But the other thing is, if you had a small amount of railroad oxide on the surface of your plant, just a small coverage, let's say more than right, fifteen percent, would that sort of um, presence on the plant surface be enough to disrupt this plant or the, the metal contribution that it, you found? It could be. Except you find that the, you know, as far as hydrogen dispersion sampling the surface, it doesn't. But you're only up to 60 or 70 percent. That right. is a possibility. At least 30 percent of your catalyst metal surface will be covered with some other species. Yes. That could roll there. We have time for one more. Bill, I'm going to have to pass it just in order to have your research. All I know is that we know is something about silicon aluminum because there's a million silicon aluminum that he could be dealing with one that was not very effective. My own comment to that is we look at many different types. <laughs> One last question. If your silica alumina is of a kitchen type and is done by uh, interaction with aluminum sulfate, with silica, there uh, remains sulfate. Well, I have in that we, case, we did do some. With a type of primal cell you are, you are know, probably a circulation of the uh, catalyst. And if it's bad, the catalyst is very black and uh, very dry. Yeah, we did some analysis for that. Actually, we were mostly worried about having chlorine around. Um, uh, I don't have sulfur on here, but I know we did we did some EDS scans for you know everything to see what was on the catalyst. I actually was more worried about having chlorine from the <coughs> tinic acid and whether that would stick onto the silica alumina the same way it's, it's, it sticks onto replaces the hydroxyls on alumina. We found no evidence for that happening with these calcinations, and similarly we didn't see any sulfur on there. So. The, with the analytic techniques we use, you can see anything. I mean, it's a point. If you had sulfate on there, it would be an issue. There's no question about it. Anything else? Thanks a lot. Okay. Good.